is Allison McGraw. The title of her talk is The University of Arizona's Arizona Astronomy Club Outreach to the Public and Beyond. All right, welcome everyone and thank you for coming. My name is Allison McGraw and I'm the Outreach Functionary for the University of Arizona Astronomy Club. And I've been talking about the outreach that the whole club immerses themselves into. So when we start to approach this uh, uh, kind of outreach, where do we start? How do people learn? That's the first thing we need to look at. Well, there's three main types of learning, right? There's visual learners, there's auditory learners, and there's kinesthetic. And kinesthetic's kind of that combination of uh, auditory and uh, visual. So we start out with auditory. We talk to the people, whether we're bringing out our telescopes or doing a demonstration for uh, the public, whatever type of public we're interacting with. We start talking about it and letting them look through it, you know, uh, look at the demonstration that we're doing, explain it. But then we have a third component. This is where we start to involve our kinesthetic, our kind of hands-on learning techniques. We actually have outreach models that the university club has made with our own blood, sweat, and tears. These aren't the type of models you can just order off some outreach online website, throw them together, have a pamphlet, have the kids do it. This is stuff that we can have the kids physically touch to make uh, tangible ideas. Here on Earth, we can quantitatively measure things. Your shoelace is 10 inches long, you walked a mile over here, and it makes good sense in your brain. But when we start talking about astronomical sizes and distances and stars, people lose it, right? It's huge, they don't get it. So these are models that they can touch. Uh, here we have a student or a, a child inside one of our um, kind of models that we have different sizes and scales for stars. So they can make good sense out of it, and it's, and it's approachable. We can tie things down to things that make sense on Earth. Why would we want to look at an atmosphere around a different planet? Why would we want to look at a magnetic field? Earth has a magnetic field. Earth has an atmosphere. We can tie this and they can make good sense out of it. And maybe they won't do astronomy when they grow up or uh, if they're older, maybe they won't change their whole uh, outlook. But maybe it'll give them that good sense of kind of what's going on in space. Uh, and then we actually need to go out into the field, right? This is our execution phase. This is where we go and we do our star parties. We actually do a free monthly star party out in a not too remote location in the desert. We don't drag them out there too far. But uh, Tucson is nice. We can just go on the edge of the desert, have a decently dark location, bring our telescopes out there, uh, do solar observing until the nightfall comes, and let these people kind of just look through the eyepiece. I mean, some people go their whole life without even seeing, say, a planet within our own solar system. And we've been doing this for about four years, and we haven't been kicked out yet, but we do the free star party. And not only that, but we uh, have no age restri restrictions. We have no uh, area restrictions. So from senior seniors to toddlers, to your backyard, to your wedding, to your parking lot, to the side of the school, we'll be there. We'll bring our telescopes. We'll be there with whatever we need to be there. We'll bring the demonstrations, all that great stuff. So uh, we're, we're kind of open to anything. And not only that, but when we do our paid star parties, as we said, we, we need money somehow. We actually do it at half the price of all the local star party competitors in the Tucson community area. And uh, it gives us that kind of openness to um, uh, do the great things like the research and come to these WS meetings that we like to do. So how do we pave the way of the future? So astronomy, we believe, should be attainable for anyone, anyone in the masses at a, at a very basic level. And positive energy and a good attitude goes a long way. And we all know this. You sit in a class, you can fall asleep. It could be great content in the class, but totally boring and not exciting. Um, one particular uh, instance that I really pride myself on is I did a star talk for about 30 minutes. And these two high school girls were attending it, and they came up to me afterwards, and they were very happy. They said that they learned more in my star talk in 30 minutes than they did in two semesters at a high school astronomy class. That was a great feeling for me, because they were excited, and maybe they were bored of the class before. They had to attend something astronomical, so they came to a star talk that I did, and they were blown away, and they actually really loved it. So uh, this gives a club member, like myself, this gives a club member uh, the reminder. Um, people know Bart J. Bach. And we have this little saying, it's called take a bomb break. And that's when you walk away from the desk, you go outside and you look at the sky, and you remember why you do this in the first place. Reminds you of the beauty of astronomy, right? Like, it's not all calculations, it's great stuff out there. And uh, it, it reminds us of that and it teaches other people to kind of see that different side of it. And we hope to collaborate with other organizations and uh, around the globe, use them universities, uh, spread our outreach ideas, give them our blueprints for our models, or um, just even maybe take their ideas and all that kind of great stuff. So I want to thank you all for coming. I want to thank the Tucson community and uh, a big thank to Dr. Don McCarthy, who's an outreach hero in the uh, University of Arizona world, and Stewart Observatory for letting us use the awesome telescopes that we get to teach everyone with. Questions, yes. There's a really loud speaker right here, so if you could come to the mic or speak louder, we'd love it. 
might be a switch. Hmm. Okay, just speak real loud. For K-12, is there any particular target object, concept, whatever, that uh, they resonate with sort of automatically in their native state of curiosity or whatever, or being you know, dragged there by their parents? And based upon that, can you say, is there any excellent gateway drug that's especially tailored for K-12? For quite K-12, I've probably noticed that solar system is the most exciting for them. Um, you know, especially because we can pull up planets within the telescope, and it's great visually to look at, but it gives them kind of a sense of their own solar system. I've noticed, you know, through eyepiece and hands-on demonstrations, um, we have our uh, Hubble zones that we have basically, we have Earth and the solar system modeled um, with the Goldilocks zone, and we have different uh, star types with different distances to where, you know, the habitable zones are. And I've noticed that that particular model is very exciting. So I would say more planetary uh, is definitely much more interesting for the younger kids. Yeah. Yes. How much do you charge for your star parties for people who are paying for them? Rather? Yeah, so it depends if we have a, if it's a really big event, we have a couple more astronomers and a couple more telescopes. But they range anywhere from about 120 uh, to 160. And that's half the going, right? Local yeah. ones are about 300. T triple A, and I work for Flanders Science Center, and there we do half the price of them. And I, yeah. So I mean, even where I work, it's like it's expensive, definitely. So we do it half the price, and we do free. I mean, we do it free for schools. I hope I said that we do it free yes. for any schools and uh, lower income stuff like that. Yeah. Awesome. Other questions? Well, I have some. Yeah, come on up and switch your slides. How many star parties does the club organize per semester? So we do the free monthly one, a Sabino, that's a solid. And then if we get contacted through our website, we do anywhere from about uh, three to seven a semester. Great. And what types of models do, does your club have to take out to events? And which have you found to be the most effective? Yeah, so we have our local stellar neighborhood. Uh, that one I found is very effective, especially when you can physically point the stars out in the night skies you're serious, there it is, that's kind of cool, right? Uh, so the local stellar neighborhoods, uh, and then we have our two habitable zones, so we have our one with, uh, with Earth and the solar system, and then the other uh, star types with the habitable zones, and then we have uh, also a newer one that's a comet model, since there's not a lot of comet action, so we have a new one for that that we bring out, and there's a few in the works. There's a globular cluster in the work, there's an open cluster in the work, and there's a carbon fiber comet in the work as well. And I think that the planetary, the Hubble zones are the most interesting for everyone. And I have one last question. How can the response, how can the response to your club's outreach efforts be quantified? To be quantified, so if we had to uh, maybe, I, I stay in contact with uh, teachers, uh, we also have several repeat star parties, uh, certain elementary schools that we've gone for several years in a row, we stay in contact with the teachers, and um, I've even had some requests for uh, some different stuff, but for younger kids, there was a particular uh, wild national park video that they wanted some middle school students, so I found a teacher that middle school students that I did star party for and said, hey, kid wants to be on TV and talk about astronomy, if they really liked our, our star party, they can um, you know, go and be on TV. So there's, it's kind of cool, we, can, we stay in contact basically with all the previous uh, type of events that we do. Great, let's thank our speaker.